I'm Adam Pascarella, and welcome to episode 15 of The Power of Bold. Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to this latest episode of The Power of Bold. I really hope that you're having a great start to the new year. I think it's going to be a great one. So I'm really excited to share this episode with you, not only for the insights that we can gather from my guest, but because I have a personal connection with the subject matter. Now, when I first started this podcast, I created a list of dream guests that I'd like to interview. The list included my guest for this episode. His name is Greg Harden, and he's an Executive Associate Athletic Director at the University of Michigan, my alma mater. Now, I'll start off by saying that Greg doesn't grant many interviews, so I'm especially grateful that he took the time to speak with me. It's his first podcast interview. When people talk about great Michigan athletes, they often refer to people like Tom Brady, Desmond Howard, Jalen Rose, and Michael Phelps. While all of those athletes have achieved massive success, The one thing that they have in common, besides their attendance at Michigan, is that they've worked with Greg Harden. Desmond Howard, the famous wide receiver on Michigan's football team, has even said that, if Greg Harden wasn't at the University of Michigan, I don't win the Heisman Trophy, which is awarded to college football's best player each year. With this background, I was pumped to speak with Greg, and I don't think our conversation disappoints. Among the things we discussed in our conversation were his upbringing in Michigan, how he became a clinical therapist, how he worked with legendary Michigan football coach Bo Schembechler to counsel the football team, his work with Tom Brady, the single greatest thing holding people back from success, and how he believes that controlling the controllables is one of the most useful things that any of us can do. It's a free-flowing conversation with many valuable insights, even for those of us who weren't college athletes. Ultimately, I think that this conversation is one of the best ways to gain Harden's decades of experience without becoming a student athlete at a school like Michigan. With that said, I hope you enjoy it. Let's get to the interview. We now welcome on Greg Harden, who is a legend in the University of Michigan Athletic Department. Greg is an executive associate athletic director at Michigan and has been called Michigan's secret weapon by former Michigan football player and Heisman Trophy winner, Desmond Howard. Having started to consult for Bo Schembechler's Michigan football team in 1986, Greg has spent decades counseling legendary Michigan student-athletes, including Desmond Howard, Tom Brady, Jalen Rose, Michael Phelps, and countless others. He is still at the University of Michigan, helping Michigan student-athletes overcome obstacles in their athletic and personal lives. So, Greg, thanks so much for appearing on The Power of Bold. Adam, thank you for inviting me. I'm pretty excited. Of course. I'd like to begin by asking you about how you identify yourself. You wear a a lot of hats at the university. You're an executive associate athletic director. You're a mentor to so many people. You're a motivational speaker. With all of that said, if I were to start a sentence by saying, my name is Greg Harden, and I am blank. How would you answer that? Well, that's a great question. My name is Greg Harden, and I'm about the business of helping people reach their full potential. I'm about the business of helping people change and grow and evolve and become the best that they can be. Right, and that's very, that's very interesting. And we're going to go all into that uh, a little bit later on. But I'd like to kind of back up to the beginning. So you grew up in Michigan, about an hour from Ann Arbor. And you were once quoted that when you were young, your perspective on life was that you needed to be angry or get your ass kicked every day. So exactly. so, so what was the most difficult part about your childhood? Well, the most difficult part of my childhood was uh, trying to uh, uh, try to represent uh, my family and at the same time try not to get my ass kicked. <laughs> right. right. So my family was about the business of education, uh, about uh, faith, and uh, my neighborhood uh, sometimes was about the business of uh, making sure that you knew you better be tough as nails, hard as nails, if you want to uh, make it to the next uh, 
<laughs> day. It wasn't as bad as it might be today. I thought it was, but compared to what some of the young people are going through uh, in this day and age, uh, I don't think it's nearly as bad as it is today. Yeah. And and so were sports kind of a way that you could escape that pressure? I know you were kind of a star athlete in high school. Well, the funny thing about it is I was a sickly child, had a- chronic asthma, and was not athletic at all. Uh for uh, maybe 12, 13 years of my life, I was uh, always uh, trying to uh, breathe and trying to be uh, uh, an intellectual. And I was I tried to be a nerd, but it just didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you, you chose sports. Uh, I think I said you were, you were a track athlete. Yeah, I played. And- I ran track and uh, played football at Southwestern High School in Detroit. Uh, but funny as it, it, as it, it may seem now, uh, I was not af- – I mean, I thought I was athletic, but no one else thought I was athletic. <laughs> um, and uh, it was no part of any team until my uh, sophomore year in high school, and I simply uh, decided to hang out with my best friend who was on going – out for track and I just went out and hung out with him for a little while and got on the track team and it was real clear to the track coach that I wasn't fast I, I didn't have the stamina to do, to do distance I couldn't jump uh well wait a minute I was going over the hurdles of a foot higher than you needed to go wait well wait a minute over time uh while they kept me on the team more like a mascot by the end of that first year I started to learn some things. Oh, my God. The same guy who was the joke turned out to be, hmm, have some skills. So I ended up uh, getting on the track team. By the end of my uh, sophomore year, I learned how to run hurdles, high jump, long jump, uh, and do whatever is required. By my junior year, I was scoring uh, 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 points like I was on the basketball team in the track meet. (laughs) So... It was hilarious. Same guy, different day. So what do you then think? It, then it changed my life. Well, what do you think happened? How did that transformation occur? Uh, well, I was committed. I was focused. I was, uh, And I was coachable. Being coachable is the key to uh, success for a whole lot of people, not, necessar- not necessarily just in athletics. Can you be trained? So uh, I... I I did what I was told to do over and over and over and tried to perfect it. I, I tried, uh, I worked out extra, and I, I focused and watched everybody and studied everybody. And the next thing you knew, um, we discovered that I had some speed and I had some uh, ability to jump. And um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was magic because my, everything changed for me at that point because I was uh, pretty quiet and uh, just trying to keep avoiding conflict. And the next thing you know, I'm like, you know, that guy on the track team and discovered that uh, uh, I had some athletic ability. And uh, so it was fun. And as you be- become a track star and you gain more experience, you eventually obtain a scholarship to Michigan. Um, and so that's kind of your, the start of your relationship with the university. Um, yep. But it sounds like the first time around, things didn't really turn out the way that you maybe envisioned. Can you? Well, let's, uh, let's put it in this context, Adam. You ready for this? We're talking about 1967, 1968. We're talking about one of the most turbulent times in American history. And we're talking about being in Detroit after the riots. We're talking about a discovery that, you know, the people who, you, who were your heroes were being assassinated. Man, it was a little intense. And so when I got to Michigan in 1967, I had a slight attitude. And I had an expectation that the the Civil Rights Act and everything that we were doing was meaningful. And I certainly thought that I was uh, smart. I thought that I was going to be able to uh, uh, study whatever I wanted. And then I was told concretely that I was going to be a phys ed teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out so well with me. At no offense, my my phys ed teacher changed my life. My coaches changed my life. 
but I didn't go to college to be a phys ed teacher. That's not who I was. I was going to college. I was going to be a philosopher. I was going to be an architect. I was going to be a psychologist. I was going to be something. And they said, no, you're going to study physical education. Well, I was a little pissed off because that's not how I saw myself. And so connecting that to the, t- the, the times, uh, I just thought it was racism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm the expectations that I would be able to function in any role other than a phys ed teacher offended me. And that was the beginning of my bad attitude, which I thought was appropriate. And I certainly didn't think that I was powerless only to find out that I had no power, no juice. And my attitude was definitely not exactly what was needed in an athletic a community in division one athletics in 1967. Right. And yeah, I can't even imagine how how things were back then and and what you were going through. And at that point, you decide to leave Michigan, correct? Yeah. And um, then you. you, Hey, I was encouraged. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Yes. And so when you're encouraged to leave Michigan, you ultimately follow through with that. Yeah, went back to Detroit. I didn't want to be here. I. Little do you know that once you leave, you're not going to come back the same. And your worldview changes dramatically. So all of a sudden, I'm going back to Detroit. That's all I wanted to do, period. Get back to Detroit and say, oops, hmm. Start working in the steel mill. Oops, hmm. <laughs> this is a tight. So I'm working in a steel mill. Adam, working in a steel mill mm-hmm. in the summer. Yes. The temperature outdoors is 90 degrees. The temperature in the area I'm working is 105. I got on a rubber suit, cleaning out uh, uh, oil and, and, and coils under a, uh, in a steel mill. I'm saying, hmm, maybe I should rethink this college education stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and then you ultimately do. You go back to Michigan um a couple more times, I believe. And that's when this interest in social work seems to take effect in you. And I think it was maybe your your third time that you went back to Michigan. You worked under one of your mentors, Dr. Howard Brabson. So I get it. Can, can you tell our listeners who he is and the effect that he had on you? Well, uh, Dr. Brabson uh, was one of those uh, professors in the School of Social Work who uh, – It was clear that he was invested in uh, the student as a real person. Uh, He made it clear that he wasn't stuck in the Eiffel Tower just thinking about research and uh, and articulating uh, and quoting uh, uh, what the research said. This guy was out in the the, uh, community. There really is a community on college campuses. And he made himself available, and, from, and, and he made it clear that all black men needed somebody to talk to. Well, not only was he approachable, I mean, he was funny. He talked a lot of smack. He acted like he thought he could kick your butt. And at the same time, he was polished, sophisticated, educated, and t- was taking care of plenty of business. So... At this stage of the game, I'm in my early 20s, and the only person who had been consistently respectful and uh, understood me as a as a whole person was Dr. Bratson. So I'm in. I'm I'm ready to make some changes. So I've gone back to school. I've gotten my undergrad degree, and so I decided to ask him for advice. And I walked into his office, Adam, and the first thing I see on his wall. You can give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Or you can teach a man to fish and feed him for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm all in. I've decided this guy is cool as all get out. (laughs) Can't (laughs) nobody be cooler than this cat. So at this stage of the game, I'm going to be uh, radio, television, and film. But I I needed to figure out my next move. And, of course, his bias is she should be a social worker. Well, there wouldn't be no dang social worker. In fact, I didn't know what a social worker was. And all my stereotypes of social work were not that positive. In fact, 
uh, our impression of social work is connected to state workers. You know, people are going to see if there's a man in your house and whether or not we're going to give you welfare. Well, that's totally different than social work, the profession of social work. And um, he allowed me to insult him and, 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 and be an idiot and describe why I didn't want to be a social worker. And then he told me, you don't know what a social worker does, son. Sit down, shut up, and listen. And that's how mm-hmm. we started. Yeah, and going back to what you said earlier, you were coachable. You were willing to learn. And then you took his lessons and became a, a clinical therapist, right? Yeah, I mean, in fact, I wasn't trying to be a clinical therapist. I, was, I wanted to do community organizing and group theory and process. I became a specialist on groups, a specialist on reading uh, uh, systems and, 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 and infiltrating uh, um, communities, and which ended up uh, setting it up so that my entry into athletics was – was golden. Um, I ended up being a clinical therapist because I had uh, been identified as a specialist in alcohol and other drug treatment. So that, you know, the clinical piece was, to me, the easiest piece. Um, But when I got to uh, Michigan Athletics, uh, all of a sudden, you've got to figure out what does it really mean to play uh, Division One athletics at this level, and you certainly need to study what is the football culture at Michigan in order to be able to assist and work with uh, these amazing, unbelievable athletes and these powerful, dynamic coaches. Right. And if, if I could, I'd like to go back to when you were originally hired to work with the Michigan football team, specifically with Bo Schembechler. I believe this was in the fall of 1986. Can, can you explain to our listeners how exactly this happened? How did you get introduced to Bo, and why did you decide to work with him? Adam, I was uh, in a hospital-based uh, alcohol drug treatment program working uh, uh, with inpatients and outpatients. Uh, it, was, it was all-consuming and very demanding. Uh, and I had created an image in the community of being that guy that you wanted to come talk to your your high school, your middle school, to your uh, organization, to your company, and t- to talk about the issues of alcohol and other drugs, its impact, uh, to talk about prevention, intervention, and retention, retention, keeping the people. And so uh, somehow I built a reputation to the point where when um, – I think the guy's name was Ron Demkowski was at Chelsea Hospital. They called Ron and said, hey, uh, could Ron, could you uh, come and speak to the football team? Ron said, I got a guy at Byer Memorial Hospital named Harden who you need to pull in to talk to this population. So I get a call from Dr. Robert Anderson. Dr. Robert Anderson says, um, why don't you come and uh, do a lecture for our football program? Well, Adam, I have been doing lectures all over the place and, and learned that the limitations of what it meant to walk in and do 30, 40 minute rah rah, we love you, just say no, and then leave. I was uncomfortable. He says, Yeah, but this is Michigan. I said, Yeah, I went to Michigan. I love Michigan. All of the above, but it's not an effective approach. Mm-hmm. So I can give you the names of some folks that you can talk to. He says, uh, That's all right. Uh, we really like for you to consider it. I say, well, I appreciate the invitation, but that's not what I do. Uh, if you guys are ever interested in talking about some programming or doing something a little more sophisticated, you know, just give me a call. Two weeks later, and I'm going to get a call. The guy says, Jim Beckler wants to meet you. Well, I'm young, fairly young, relatively speaking. And, of course, I say, I want to meet him. So <laughs> I say, and this is what I need. Adam, I'm so stupid. I set up a kangaroo court for myself. <laughs> I say, man, not only do I want to meet him, I want to meet the, the head sport administrator. I want the team physician. I want the athletic trainer. I want all the stakeholders to be present because I'm going to come in and I've got a series of questions I'm going to ask you about if, in fact, I came and did a presentation to your football team. What would be the results if some kid in that group said, I need help? That's the only way I'll work with you. He says, okay, we'll set it up. I show up at this uh, training table, and I'm sitting at a table. And, of course, 
uh, given the fact that this is uh, 2018, and Adam, I've listened to some of your work and like what you're trying to create, and so i got to give it to you straight. Of course, I'm the only brother in the room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I've got a cast of characters of, 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 of the young, well, middle-aged uh, gentlemen who are all just sitting around waiting to hear me talk. The guy introduced me, and he says, Shim Beckler, this is Harden. He's going to tell you about his program. Well, that's not what I came for, Adam. But at this point, Adam, I better talk about a program. Sure. So we had a great meeting. Uh, Shim Beckler uh, asked me a series of questions. I responded, shared with him what I thought was important in terms of how do you uh, do, focus on not just reacting to if somebody has a problem. By the time a coach has a clue, it's a day late and a dollar short. So I should suggest to him we've got to think about prevention. We've got to think about intervening when there's a problem. And we ultimately have to be committed to retain and keep somebody who may have an illness, may be flirting or experimenting, and try to increase the chances that we don't lose anybody. He says, I like it. So how many? Uh, so how do you want to do this? I said I want six sessions, an hour and a half each. He tried not to laugh, but he laughed. <laughs> and he says to me, "I'll give you three. I said, "What?" He said, "I'll give you three sessions." I said, "Wow." Okay, coach. I said, "I only need one more thing." He said, "What's that?" I said, "I need you to introduce me, and I need you to let me kick you out of the room." And that's how it began. He was, I say, we'll spend time together. Uh, you'll know exactly what I'm going to do, why I'm going to do it, how I'm going to do it. And if you're comfortable, I need you to turn it over to me because I don't have time to build. I don't have six months to build a relationship. I need instant credibility. He said, boy, that makes total sense. And that's how I started with uh, Michigan football in 1986. Um, Shem Beckler educated me, tutored me, prepared me to understand what it really meant to try to run a program that was so powerful that could change lives. And to get in and be talking about developing people and not just football players, uh, he was all in. That's an amazing story. And for, for those of the listeners who don't know much about Michigan football, Bo Schembechler could be pretty fiery to say the least. So how, how did you find the courage to really say all this to Bo so early on in your relationship? I don't, I don't know him. I just know he's a, he's a coach. To me, he's a guy. And if he's serious about working with young people, then I'm the guy. I wasn't trying to talk to him about football. I wasn't qualified. But what I know is what I know. And if you're going to trust me and involve me, then you got to let me lead in the area that I'm an expert in. It made total sense to him. Because you got to understand, at this stage of the game, uh, uh, coaches had been like everything, and they had the responsibilities they had was to be not just the coach, but they had to be the mentor. They had to be the surrogate parent. They had to uh, play the priest, the rabbi, the, whatever. And so it was getting more and more complicated by the 80s as these young people came in more complicated um, more diverse, more demanding, and their expectations of what and what they needed was becoming more dramatic. And when we're talking about alcohol and other drug issues, that was not easy to simply say, as a head coach, you simply won't do it. And that's, it doesn't work like that. And he figured it out. Shim Beckler figured it out. He needed somebody whose area of expertise could help him uh, uh, support a kid that may be struggling or a kid who is 18 to 22 year olds in a college campus are going to be exposed to everything. So that's how it worked. Mm-hmm. And I, it, it's nothing special about me. It's simply my area of expertise. I was comfortable in. Right. And you've been involved at the university for decades. Now you've built such a gr- good relationship with the student athletes there and with the administration and the coaches and so now I'd like to kind of transition and speak about your, your work with these student-athletes. 
And uh, like I said, you often provide them counsel when they're facing obstacles in their sport or even at the university as a whole. And to start off, for the student athletes that visit you, you provide a lot of guidance on the mental aspect of sport. So, and and that, that's what it was transformed into. But, but, right. Joe Roberson was the athletic director. Um, and um, yeah, originally when I started, he was not the uh, director, but he became the athletic director in 1994, I believe. So by then, uh, you got to understand, Michigan was a client. And uh, your audience is going to know more than the average person about what I really do. My clients were not athletes. My clients were College of Engineering, Medical School, Dow Chemical, Libby Owens Ford, Michigan Consolidated Gas. I'm working with people all over as a consultant and, and because I, I leave uh, uh, the hospital and open up my consulting. Well, I had great clients. And so my work with corporations, with uh, working with uh, um, employees, is what I superimposed into the athletic community, trying to help people understand that if you focus on alcohol and other drugs only, you miss an opportunity to help people. And so what we did was begin to start talking about how do you support young people in becoming the best that they can be. Uh, and so the alcohol drug piece opened up a door for social work to infiltrate athletics. The social work perspective is seeing a whole person, seeing their strengths and not just their weaknesses, not their pathology. And so uh, Michigan was one of the first places that embraced and said, could you come in and, and take it to the next level? And I got it. And that's how it all started. So next thing you know, we're talking about, Young men and women, young men and women having access to someone to talk to about life and the pursuit of happiness, what's working, what's not working. So not only are we going to look at the troubled athlete and the person who's struggling with something, but now we're talking about how do you become the best athlete. And the mental game is the game, especially when we start talking about uh, uh, high school to college and let, we won't even go into college to professional so again the work that uh, that we're doing is talking about how do you develop people to be the best that they could possibly be but it's not limited to sports mm -hmm. through your work with companies like you were saying dow chemical other companies in michigan and your work with student athletes at michigan what is the number one or the, the most prominent obstacle that prevents individuals from getting to be the best that they can be? You say number one? Yeah. Are you going to insist on it being number one? All right. <laughs> I'm going to insist on it being number one is going to be negative self-talk, how I talk to myself, how I, how I communicate internally. If the enemy within, the enemy within is the enemy. So we're not just talking about mental health where somebody has a biochemical uh, imbalance and their depression is not just because of their attitude or, or how they were raised. And that, that happens, but oftentimes we're talking about a person who is not mentally ill. We're talking about a person that wants to be the best at what they're doing. So the mental game, when we start talking about it, is how do you talk to yourself? How do you respond when you make a mistake? How do you respond when you're anxious and, and when you're fearful? We, we try to teach people that anxiety and fear is normal. Mm -hmm. If you, Adam, think about some of the most fun you've ever had in your life. Think about a moment where you were daring and, and, you, and you tried something and, and it turned out to be a magical moment. You were about to crap your pants before you did. <laughs> exactly. Some of the most fun I've had and everyone listening has had in their life, they were about to like, Whew, I don't know if I should do this. Let's do it. And after they did it and it worked, they said, let's do it again. Anxiety must be turned into excitement and fear must be turned into passion. How we talk to ourselves, how we process, how we, um, how we begin to become brutally honest with ourselves 
Those are the keys, brother. When we start talking about the number one thing is how do I talk to myself? Am I honest with myself? Can I see myself clearer than everyone else? The ultimate goal, Adam, is to teach people to become the world's greatest expert on one subject. What do you think that is? It's got to be you. Come on. (laughs) If you become the world's greatest expert on yourself, that means you know your strengths and your weaknesses better than anyone else. Do you Mm -hmm. understand? Mm -hmm. The breakthrough that comes when you are no longer afraid to look at your weaknesses and analyze them, when you're no longer that guy who's like, is so humble or so insecure that no one can tell you uh, about your strengths and you can't see your strengths, but you can only see your weaknesses. What we're discovering is that people, even high performance individuals keep turning out to be human beings struggling with the same crap everyone else is struggling with. (laughs) Yeah. Whether we're talking about a corporate executive or whether we're talking about an Olympian, or whether we're talking about that walk-on, that walk-on that everybody believes in because they're playing the game out of love, and there's no confusion about it. But you know that they're struggling mentally to make it to the next level. Yeah, and I, I guess one of the best examples of a client that you worked with was Tom Brady, and even when he came on to Michigan's campus, you know, for, for people that don't know, he was competing for a quarterback spot with a highly recruited uh, competitor, Drew Henson. And so at that point, when he comes into your office, he says to you, you know, I should be starting. What do I do? What did you tell him at that point? Uh, well, and, and by the way, even if pe- the people are listening, maybe, they, maybe there'll be a handful of people who don't know who Tom Brady is. But he's identified as being one of the best that ever played the game. Some call him the GOAT. Um, when he walks into my office, now understand, he self-selects to come in. He's not sent. He's not mandated. He says, I've watched what you've done. I like what you and Desmond have done. And I just want to be a starter in Michigan. Adam, the first thing I've got to tell him is like, bro, I can't help you be a starter. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to create a fantasy that I can get you a starting position. I'm not going to talk to the coaches. I can't teach you how to uh, 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 pass. I can't teach you anything except to believe, if no one else believes in your ass, that you're capable, you're qualified, and you're the best. If nothing else I can give you, I can give you an attitude that says, if they never play me, I know who I am and what I'm about. And Brady looks at me and say, I'll start there. Huh. And then at that point, he's competing for the job, and he ultimately gets it, and he has a good career in Michigan, you know. And it's, I guess my question for you is, what does he do, even at Michigan and obviously now, what does he do that other people don't do? That's a great question, Adam. You ready for this? I'm ready. Uh. Brady, you talk about coachable. You understand, while he's the guy you have to put out of the building to stop looking at film, the average person, how long do I have to be here? Okay, I'm going to coach. I'll look at one more. You know, Brady is that guy you say, son, you you need a break. Brady is that guy that's studying defenses. So he's like the offensive coordinator. And he, he's that guy that is going to be who is so hungry and believes that the most fascinating thing to him about him to me is how he can have a chip on his shoulder and 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 and, and operate as though he's never started and that he wants the job. This guy at every stage of his development that you've seen that everyone else has seen. He's operating as though somebody's trying to take my job. That attitude, that attitude keeps him on fire. This guy's 40 years old. Yeah. Yeah. On fire. Do you think that attitude kind of developed with him when he was at Michigan and even beyond? Or was he kind of born with that chip on his shoulder? Say, man, uh, let me make life real simple for you. Tom Brady was the runt of the family. His sisters 
were like demigoddesses <laughs> in California in terms of athletics, especially softball. <laughs> you understand? And he was uh, Brady's little brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. And so all his life he had to prove something. And he came in with that mindset. He also came in with a mindset of respecting authority. His mama and daddy raised him to be a, a, a young man that would walk in and, and say, tell me what you need me to do, and it will be done. Mm-hmm. So uh, he came in with a – so anybody run around taking credit for what Tom Brady be, uh, became is, is exaggerating to make a point. <laughs> Tom Brady came in with some stuff that the average person doesn't have. But the average person can have what he came in with. <laughs> uh-huh. Dogged determination, a commitment to be coachable, trainable, a willingness to learn, a willingness to push himself. When the average person doesn't want to do anything, this guy gives 100%, 100% of the time. And you would give similar advice to, say, like a white-collar worker, a 20 or 30-something that wants to get promoted at their job or wants a job with more responsibility, you would just say. say, Yeah, I mean, let's be real clear. We're talking about giving people an opportunity to learn what does it take to be the best. Now, if my quest is to be promoted, I I just can't uh, hope and just be diligent. I've got to learn things that the average person in my position is not trying to learn. I've got to volunteer to do stuff I don't know how to do. I've got to be that guy that is willing to uh, uh, push himself in the areas that are most uncomfortable. So I'm going to teach that that, that future CEO to be a future CEO. You first have to commit to self-mastery, mastering your emotions, mastering your fears, mastering your insecurities, being so confident about who you are becoming that you're comfortable with the fact that you're flawed. Hello. Mm -hmm. We are all flawed. Nobody is going to be perfect. But the pursuit of perfection can be more fun than (laughs) bubblegum. Exactly. Do you think uh, Brady's going to do well in this this, uh, year's playoffs? How far do you think they'll go? Well, uh, let's, let's be real clear. In any any, I don't have to convince people. I'm biased. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I would never bet my money against him. Now I might bet your money. <laughs> him. <laughs> yeah. You understand? Yeah. My confidence and belief in who he is and who he plans. He's still becoming. It's, it's people don't understand. You never stop growing. This guy continues to grow and evolve and become who he's dreaming of becoming. He's not satisfied. He's not satisfied with having more Super Bowl uh, victories than anyone. He's not satisfied with being uh, going into his 40s and, 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 and seeming more healthy, more qualified than everyone else. He wants more. So why would I bet against a guy? who last year gave us the most exciting, most exhilarating, unbelievable performance we've ever seen in a Super Bowl. How would I bet against a guy who came in, who uh, uh, sat out for four games, uh, who people want to fantasize he beat them because (laughs) the air pressure? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's... It's okay. hard to argue with you. That just, that just cracks me up. <laughs> you know, yeah, so how do I think he will do? I think that he will take his team that believe in him and take him as far as they are prepared to go. If there's any guy that can get more out of, of, of uh, mediocrity, uh, you have seen some of the lineups, some of the uh, starters he's had to work with, and they're good athletes. They're not great always, but he – by the time they're, he's done, by the time Belichick and he have done what they do, they look great for a brief moment in time. Mm-hmm. So I'm not betting against him, brother. Uh, I wouldn't either. <laughs> Definitely wouldn't. 
it going back to what you were saying, he's just not satisfied. He wants to keep mastering himself and his athletic skills. It seems to go to your idea of controlling the controllables. I think that's a phrase that you've told many Michigan athletes. Yes. Uh, can you maybe speak about that to our audience, just explaining on a basic level what it means and how you've seen it in practice? Uh, and, and I swear it was born out of my work in alcohol and other drugs. Are you ready for this? One of the greatest uh, quotes I've ever heard in life is called the serenity prayer. Mm-hmm. Most, a lot of people have heard this, uh, and a lot of people have no clue that it's been popularized in, uh, I think, AA and all that. But the, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Mm-hmm. Listen to that carefully. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Well, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, wow, this is this is the, this is the stuff. And I say, how else can you talk about it? So, through all my work, it keeps going back to. I have to learn to control what I can't control. And one thing I can control is me. I I can barely do that. But when it compared to all other things I'm fantasizing I need control over, I can't control them. But the one shot I've got, Adam, is self-discipline, self-motivation, self-respect, right? Self-definition. I can control at least how I respond. So to control the controllables, it starts by first understanding, taking the responsibility of who's running your life, who's, who's running your emotions. So I just love the whole concept of um, teaching people that the one thing that they need to learn how to count on is themselves. Right. And having the discipline to, to carry out the changes that you need to make, not only recognizing them. And self self motivation. If we start talking about, uh, uh, okay, here's the secret. Don't tell anybody I told you. All right, <laughs> got it. Now, imagine you're sitting in a room with a uh, 300 pound heavyweight wrestler who's uh, from such and such an Iowa, and uh, he's just struggling to just improve. And you've been meeting with him for several uh, months now. And you've built a relationship uh, where, where you can just be straight with him. And so at a certain point, you have to tell anybody, whether they are a uh, 16-year-old uh, cross-country whiz kid, young lady who's in the medical school and got in school two years early because she's so smart, or whether you're talking about a 300-pound lineman, wrestler, whether you're talking about the uh, 100 Pound gymnast, at certain point, Adam, you've got to tell anybody that will listen. The secret is self-love and self-acceptance. Mm-hmm. Fight for it. Believe in it. Trust it. If you cannot love yourself, don't, don't matter what I tell you. I can know how good you are. I can know how your potential. It doesn't mean anything if you don't believe it. And so, one of the biggest flaws we have in society is people are always looking for love in all the wrong places. Self-love and self-acceptance. I'm not talking about the narcissistic, ego-driven nonsense that's it, uh, uh, reinforced constantly uh, uh, by media. I'm talking about being comfortable in the skin you're in. I'm talking about loving yourself, flaws and all. I'm talking about accepting yourself, flaws and all. I'm talking about being somebody that, whether I become an amazing athlete or not, my self-worth and self-esteem is not based on my performance. How I feel about me is not based on football, basketball, mm-hmm. gymnastics, my job title, how much money I'm making. We all know rich, powerful people that nobody can stand there. <laughs> yeah, kids don't even love them. So why not? 
because their notion of love is connected to you've heard uh in in the uh judeo christian piece that uh money is uh the root of all evil you've heard that before i have that's not exactly what it says what it really says is the love of money exactly is the root of all evil so when we love things other than uh what it really means to be given the gift of life, we're going to have some problems, son. This is a gift, a blessing, an unbelievable opportunity to become and reach your full potential. But you will not reach it unless you decide to let go of yesterday's baggage, to commit yourself to uh, becoming someone whose behavior is consistent with their beliefs. I'm sorry, I got, I, I got on a tangent. <laughs> that's, hey, a, that's, I, okay. I just, that's okay. Man, can you imagine? I get to do this for a living every day. This is what I get to talk about, reinforce, and I've got to believe it, or no one else will believe it. Is there anything you'd be rather doing, I guess, than what you're doing? Is did you have you always? I mean, I guess at this point, you don't see yourself doing anything else. I, I mean, I see myself uh, uh, continuing to be a change agent continuing to be somebody that gives more than he takes. You know, I wanted to be some, my original plan was radio, television, and film. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be in front of the camera and back of the camera. I was going to tell stories, write stories, direct, produce, do everything I could to begin to talk about how the people can see themselves differently from a different perspective. But I got addicted to helping people. There's mm-hmm. nothing better than, I mean, the only person that, look, at Michigan, I've got the greatest job in Michigan. I just don't get paid like the other folks. <laughs> 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 you know, there's some people that think some of these other jobs are better, but I get to see a student athlete. I get to see uh, coaches. I get to see the outside of Michigan. I get to see the CEO. I get to see uh, the manager, administrator as real people mm-hmm. and I can't think of anything that could be better than what I'm doing and not only do you get to see the real people they open up to you but you get to see the change which I'm sure is where the real excitement happens see Adam you know you, I, I kind of like the way that you operate <laughs> you know I'm good at this think about this man ask me you just ask me without asking me what is the highlight the highlight, son, is watching a 17-year-old snot-nosed, arrogant, uh, pistol-packing nitwit walk in here and turn into an adult and a person of substance. Can you imagine? I see children walk in, and when they leave at 21, 22 years old, I see them become adults, real adults. Uh, one of the jokes I tell when I'm doing uh, uh, presentations to um, college students is I tell them, I know you think you came here to uh, get a degree and maybe to participate in um, athletics, but I want you to be real clear. You came here to grow up, not to grow up. Uh-huh. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yep, because 18 to 22 is the most important period of a person's life. Now, there'll be other periods, but when we're talking about development, mom and daddy or whoever raised you have done all they can do. Now, 18 to 22, you better figure out who you are and what you're about. Because if your life ain't working after that, we're looking at you. Mm -hmm. We ain't blaming your mama and your daddy and your cousin and and, uh, racism and everybody else. We're looking at you. What did you do? What did you decide? How do you see yourself? What decisions do you make? So, yeah, it's fun watching someone who, I mean, I have people in my office out. Well, I can't say that. This is a family show. So (laughs) there's some folks that you meet who you would never talk to them outside of your office because of the way they carry themselves, their attitude, their disposition, their arrogance, their ignorance. And there'll be people who, like, I would not talk to them if I didn't have to. 
But sometimes some of those people turn out to be my favorite people I've ever worked with because they evolve and change. And change is inevitable, son. That would be avoided or evaded. You can be a part of change or have your ass kicked. We're done, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I just ask you quickly, what's the biggest, or who's the person that has had the most change under you from the four or three years they were at Michigan? Hmm. I can't answer that, son. Is that's just that's that's a very complicated question, and there'll be people who uh, really have been in my office and they have been working on issues. And the reason that my, it worked for decades is because confidentiality was the name of the game. Mm-hmm. I just became uh, uh, I went on sixty minutes because I was about ready to retire, and so I didn't mind talking about it. And, doesn't want to call me secret weapon. I ain't no secret no more, apparently. <laughs> but I tell you, there have been some amazing transformations. And uh, I'll tell you a favorite story. I had this kid who was uh, a, a gangbanger. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, people who come to college in athletics. And by the way, there are more than two sports in athletics. Right. But uh, the most popular sports are pretty obvious. So I've got this uh, football player that's coming in, and before he gets here, I've got coaches, I've got administrators calling me saying, you're really going to have to talk to this kid. I say, what? He said, well, why are you recruiting him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he, he's unbelievable. He's an amazing athlete. I say, but you just dis- what you described to me is this kid is, okay, fine. If he gets here, when he gets here, let me know. The kid gets here. In a matter of moments, it's pretty clear that he really did come from when everyone else fantasized they came from. We, uh, By the way, there's a whole bunch of men who are, have African ancestry and some who do not, who think they hard, uh, who constantly have to... Uh, put on these airs and these, these and create these false impressions about how tough and how bad they are. I like to call them video gangsters. You know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. they, they dress like they hard, they talk like they hard, and boom, boom, boom. This kid was hard. <laughs> there's fake ass gangsters, and there's real gangsters. His daddy was a gangster, his cousins was gangsters, he been a gangster, and he was just so, happened to be so good in athletics that he gets a scholarship to Michigan. Well, he's not the most uh, easy to talk to. He's got a few trust issues. And so we're working together in, in like because he's in trouble, not only because they asked me to, but he's always in trouble, and he's in my office. Well, Adam, for some odd reason, we bond. His neighborhood, not mine. The sounds that you hear. <laughs> uh, so the kid shows up on campus. He's in trouble. He's in my office. We're working together. A year and a half goes by. He's in and out of trouble. We, But we, we're together so much that, hey, we start bonding. All of a sudden, he starts making some changes. Well, he's reluctant to, but he's making a few. And he's quite the athlete. Having to make a long story short, uh, two years goes by, everything's going okay, he's eligible, he's functional, and he's a good athlete. He's in my office because now I can't get rid of him. He's, hey, G, what you doing? <laughs> Come on in. We're, hey, we're just relaxing. Summer, he comes into my office just to kick it, say, say hello. So I'm bored, Adam, which is not a good thing for me. <laughs> I'm bored out of my mind. He shows up and I say, say, you know what? We've been doing some good work. He said, yeah, you, we've been cold. I said, you know what? I just want to put something in front of you. He said, what's that? I said, you know, people around here think you're dumb as a box of rocks. He said, what? I said, people think you're dumb as a box of rocks. He said, yeah, I know. I said, but you're not. He said, yeah, I know. I said, but you might be. He said, what? 
I said, we don't have any evidence. We have no data that says that you are as smart as you and I think you are. I said, you know, we've been working on some a lot of stuff, my man, but we have run out of stuff to work on. So I'm going to challenge you. He said, what? I said, have you ever been a student? Eh, not really. I said, so, like, what if, I, what if you are dumb as a box of rocks? Shouldn't we find out? He said, man, will you stop what you want me to do? I said, say, man, I want to run an experiment. I want you to practice, train, and rehearse understanding a simple concept. He said, what's that? I said, I want you to learn to give 100%, 100% of the time at everything you do. I want you to compete at everything, compete at everything. You hear what I'm saying? He says, what do you mean? I say, brother, if you want to be the best athlete you can be, I'm going to suggest that you can increase your chances of being successful by being the best at everything. As a matter of fact, if you've got to go to class, I think you should walk in expecting an A. Worst case scenario, if you expect an A, I want you to be in a situation where if you get a B, you can pretend you're pissed off. He said, you're crazy. I said, but what else do we have to work on? He says, well, you make a good point. I said, let's see what happens. So we start working on this, Adam, for the whole summer. Now, fall comes. We're working on it. It gets to the point where I even forget that that's what we're working on. <laughs> so... Semester goes by, he comes back, his grades are going up a little bit, and we're amused. A year goes by, Adam, the next summer shows up. Uh, it's May. He walks into my office, and he says, gee, guess what? I said, what? He said, I'm on the dance list, fool! <laughs> <laughs> wow. We cry and laugh and giggle. Like, you know, like we're like little Girl Scouts. <laughs> no one could prepare me to see this gangster rooted cat walk into my office. I told him that, he, that nothing could prepare him to understand how much joy it would bring him if he ended up being, get a three point when no one expects it. Adam, he was so happy. Adam, I was so happy. Adam, I'll never forget this experience. Everyone wants to talk about this, that, and the other as it relates to the, the work I've done. One of the magic moments of my life was this kid from California who had done some outrageous things, walks into my office, and is giddy about being on the dean's list, which meant he had a three-point more than one semester. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. And like you said, it sounds like he just, he really took to heart your advice of putting 100% in to, to everything and just trying to prove to himself that he could apply 100% to all aspects of his life. The lesson, Adam, is this. If you can give 100% at the stuff you don't even like, what happens to you when you get to the stuff you love? Right. right. Think about that. Right. right. And so to uh, to wrap up here, I, I'd just like to ask you really quickly. I'm, I'm an avid listener of podcasts, and I came across one that asks a set of questions to each guest to wrap up. Um, so I couldn't resist ask, asking you these questions. So assume that you're going to a desert island forever, and you can only bring one book, one movie, and one electronic device. What do you bring? One book. One book, one movie, and one, movie. And, and one electronic device. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is deep. All right. Uh, one book. Um, are you ready for this? I'm ready. I'm taking two books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one is going to be uh, a book that describes all religion, but the most important book is going to be um, Victor Frankl's V-I-K-T-O-R, Frankl, F-R-A-N-K-L, Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. It's a classic, unbelievable read. It's the story of a guy that was in the concentration camps in Germany and who survived, and he survived 
mentally and spiritually by having a sense that his life had purpose in spite of what was going on and how many uh, devastating moments and how, how he was suffering and people were being slain around him and loved ones and friends and buddies and pals. He continued to believe that his life had purpose. That's the book, Man Search for Meaning. The movie. Dang, man, that's not fair. <laughs> Ain't take a Bruce Lee movie. Mm, <laughs> mm. I can't. Hey, if I were to take a martial arts movie, it, it might be uh, Fearless uh, with Jet Li. Uh-huh. What I would probably take is Shawshank Redemption. Mm, good choice. Come on, man. <laughs> Shank Redemption. Yeah, you know, check it out. Uh, in terms of electronic advice, if I'm on a desert island, I hate to tell you this, Adam. I have ever heard in my life. I'm on a desert island. <laughs> <laughs> Get a peace out, really. Really. So I don't know, bro. I, I can't plug it in. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think I would take a, a power generator. There you go. There, there you go. go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you on the book too. Man Search for Meaning. It's a very quick read. It's only about a hundred, hundred fifty pages. It's a it's, uh, very it's haunting two, one. You you you've read that? I have. Yes, have, yeah. my man. And it's two parts to the book. Let's warn people. Yes, yeah. it's not necessary to read this part two because it talks about a therapeutic intervention formula that uh, Dr. Frankel created that uh, builds off of the whole notion. But part one, part one will change your life. I used to yeah. read it at least every three years to remind me to stop whining and complaining about the stuff I would complain about. Yeah. I, so I hope this I, has been useful for you, Adam. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. That book is just, it's a haunting book. It changes your life and it helps you keep things in, keeps things in perspective. My man. Yeah. Well, Greg, thank you so much for appearing on the podcast. I greatly appreciate it and wish you all the best with your work this year. Thank you, young man. I look forward to uh, hearing it and talking to you again in the future. Uh, peace out to everybody that, that, that happens to be smart enough to listen to Adam. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. All right, young blood. Take peace. care. So a special thanks to Greg Harden for appearing on the podcast. I was definitely fired up after our conversation, and I hope you are too. Greg is a true Michigan legend. And as a Michigan fan, I'm so glad that he's in our corner. That's it for this episode of The Power of Bold. Get in touch with us through Facebook and Twitter, and visit thepowerofbold.com for show notes and a transcript of this episode. If you'd like to get in touch with me directly, feel free to email adam at thepowerofbold.com. Once again, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time. <laughs>